Well, I guess we're going to get straight to it. Um, so thank you all for coming today. My name is Brianna Wu. I am Head of Development at Giant Space Cat. And I'm honored to be doing this panel today with scholar, PhD candidate. You're a PhD candidate? OK. Uh, yeah. And you're also Paragon Femme Shep, Catherine Cross. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much. Yeah, I tried doing a Paragon playthrough. I, I couldn't do it. I tried it. I'm renegade all the way. It just, I can't, I can't make it happen. <laughs> uh, less kicking people out of windows for me, alas. Come on, that's the whole fun of Mass Effect. So, um, you know, everybody, before we start this panel today, um, I did want to have a little bit of an opening statement. Um, about why I reached out to GamerX and, you know, flew out here, you know, took time out of my crunch, you know, work in crunch right now at my company to kind of have this panel at GamerX. And, you know, for me, this is a story that all started on a snowy rooftop in Boston. And, you know, we're about to talk about some really serious stuff. So, you know, every single time I fly out of Boston, I have to go past this dreary apartment building. And it's probably not an apartment building you would notice or think about if you drove past it. But for me, every time I see it, it, it just feels like I'm getting, my gut is punched because it is a building where my friend Evelyn, um, she took her own life on that rooftop. And, you know, she took, um, she took some pills and wandered up there and um, slipped into unconsciousness and ended up freezing to death. And... You know, I would love to tell you that what happened to Evelyn was like an isolated incident, but it's not. It's a pattern of abuse that every single person in this room that's familiar with the transgender community, we know this, we see this, we feel it every single day. And especially in this last year with Gamergate, I mean, just go onto my Twitter and you can see just the, the litany of transgender abuse that, that comes towards anyone that speaks up for transgender issues in the game industry. And, you know, the truth is, if you're not white, straight, cisgender, and male, you know, this is not a place where you can feel comfortable. Um, I tried to invite my friend um, Ellen to this panel today. She did a, um, she did a article along with me for the Mary Sue where we looked at um, the argument, basically, that Samus was a transgender character. And, you know, if you grew up in the 80s or 90s and you were looking for transgender heroes, you know, they basically did not exist. You know, you had poison, sort of. We all know the terrible, you know, history with that. But, you know, all too often, like right now, there are transgender boys and girls that are growing up right now, and they're looking at games, and they're looking for characters that look like them, and they just simply do not exist. And, you know, the blowback that Ellen and I got for that piece was unconscionable. It was, it was truly terrible. And that was a moment that I realized we have got to start speaking up about the way the transgender gamers are treated in the game industry. And that goes on both sides. It goes for me in the professional development sphere, but it also happens on the game consumer side and in the academic side. And it's just absolutely got to change. And you know, this is where we're gonna get really serious for a minute. I am 38 years old. At this point in my life, I have seen nine people that I care about commit suicide, nine transgender friends. And I know if I have transgender friends here in this room today that you've seen the same thing yourself. And you know, the truth is what happened to Evelyn, it doesn't even come close to representing the horror that our culture enacts on transgender people every single day. So in the, in the face of all of that abuse, do we carve out a little path for ourselves in our careers? Do we stay silent? Do we try to get along? Do we watch out for ourselves? I think that's the easy choice. I think for us, I think when you're faced an impossible, with an impossible situation, I think you have to ask yourself what your imperative is, what your reason for doing what you're doing is. And I think if you're gonna look in the room around you today, your imperative is sitting right next to you, like the entire queer community. We are here and our voices are our imperative, our words, our deeds, you know, the humanity that we show every single day. 
And if getting to a gamer culture where transgender people are treated as human beings seems impossible, there's something else that we can reach for, and that's justice justice and to create an industry where we are treated like human beings, all of us in the queer community. It just absolutely has to change. So on that heavy note, Catherine, <laughs> I'm going to kick it over to you. And um, I thought that we would kind of have a bit of a panel discussion today. Did you, did you have any thoughts on any of that before we started? So obviously, as uh, many of my regular readers know, I am a transgender woman and I have written about that, uh, about the perspective of being a trans woman in gaming culture. And I've received quite a lot of flack for it, especially over the last year. Uh, it's not at all uncommon for people to enter my mentions to call me a, a degenerate or what have you. Uh, one person was telling me that, uh, that my ugliness was a clear sign of the fact that I had not, you know, gotten into a good relationship with God. And I go, yes, that's entirely true. I am I am one with the goddess, thank you very much. Uh, so, you know, it's just that, that sort of quotidian background radiation that, that one has to deal with. For my own part, though, I, I focus a lot on what it is that trans creators in the gaming space have been doing independently. Over the last decade, what we've started to see is that with the liberalization of tools for creating games, making it easier than ever for even just a single person sitting at home to create a complex and involving game, you've started to see trans people speaking more and more in our unfiltered voices. And what has happened over the last decade is not necessarily that there are more of us than ever in the world of gaming, because, you know, let's face it, I, you know, I think you know, a lot of us in this room might be able to confirm this one way or another. We are, we are nerds, we are geeks and dorks, inveterately since our youth. We have been here from the start. But what has changed over the last 10 years is that more of us are able to speak in a, an increasingly less filtered way. We are able to make games by ourselves for ourselves, which has been contemporaneous with a sort of renaissance in more traditional media where you're starting to see, for instance, courtesy of Topside Press and Beauty Press, uh, books and poetry written by trans people, particularly trans women who are very often unheard of but often spoken about by people who don't know us. Now we're writing our own stories and most importantly, we are creating them with the intention of speaking to our own community, first and foremost. We no longer have the pseudo-generic cisgender audience in mind. We are writing what we've always wanted to see and what we think our own people would like to see. So there's a lot that gives me hope in the midst of everything that Brianna was just talking about, which is a very grim reality that we still live with. But the ability for us to seize the means of cultural production, as I put it on the, the last panel I, I was speaking on, that's vital, and that represents a dramatic shift from what we've seen over the last several years. So. Yeah. I think that's very well said. Um, but I do want to, I want to kind of go on that question and talk about that a little bit more. I think that there is, um, you know, there are certainly academic feminists, and you know, for me, I'm more on the developer side. You know, like I wasn't here at GamerX yesterday because I was talking to venture capitalists trying to raise $23 million. And you know, it is, um, game development is a very, 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 very expensive industry. Mm -hmm. It is really, really expensive. If you want to create a character, for instance, if you want to pay the people that create a rigged character for you a fair wage, mm -hmm. like we're talking, probably four, five, six, seven thousand dollars for a well-made character with a retopology pass and rigging. So mm -hmm. you have something I hear all the time is if you don't like it, go make your own game, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know, game making is so extremely expensive, especially if you're going to like make it at your own at a at a scale where people are actually going to see that. And I think when you couple that with the, the traditionally sky-high rates of poverty and unemployment mm -hmm. for transgender people, that seems like a very high barrier to cross. So, I mean, what do you think about that? I think it's a high barrier for you know, certainly transgender people specifically. Right. You know, obviously our, our collective income is not exactly very high. I don't make a whole lot of money, but I know that I'm already in like maybe the top 5% of trans women's income brackets in this country. Right. 
And so it's definitely, it's a barrier. It's also a barrier for anyone outside of the traditional channels in the gaming industry, I think. Uh, it's, and it's something that's been challenging for a lot of people to confront, which is why I've been heartened by people making their own games through less expensive means. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Anna Anthropy's book, uh, Rise of the Video Game Zinsters, is a useful catalog of this trend in recent years towards people making their own games uh, by themselves on the cheap. And the thing is, is that this still raises another sustainability issue because many of those people who do make those games are also not making a great deal of money. Many of them, even if they try to sell their games for like $5 a pop, they're not exactly making bank on, what, on their own cultural products. So financial sustainability is a tremendous problem that I think a lot of us face, no matter how you try to do it, whether it's trying to raise a great deal of money for a sleek sort of triple A style production or whether you're just making it by yourself and trying to uh, you know, make ends meet that way, it can be extremely difficult. Well, I think this is where it ties into the, the larger culture, right? Because we, we do have a culture, a gamer culture that is tremendously hostile to transgender gamers. I mean, mm -hmm. look at the backlash my friend Ellen and I got for that piece on Samus. Like, go read the thousands of Mary Sue comments, and that's after they moderated them. Um, you know, so I think, like, how, how do, and this isn't just transgender people, how do queer people in general start pushing back on the system that is so built for white, straight, cisgender people. Like how, how do you start forcing your way into that? Like do you, do you kind of demand you have a place at the table? Do you, do you play by the rules? Do you try to fit in? Like how, how do you start to push back on that? I don't think that any of those things are mutually exclusive as the thing. I mean, certainly a certain amount of engagement with the system is all but required. I, I, I talked about this a bit on the last panel, and I think this is a, a useful opportunity for me to expand on the point. I do think that there's a, an unnerving tendency within radical communities to allow skepticism of institutions to metamorphose into boycotting the institutions entirely and insisting that everyone from your identity or affinity group does the same, and discouraging any efforts made by people to compromise or engage with that institution. The gaming industry is is tremendously fucked up. I, I don't think there's any other way to put it. And I think that a lot of us know that for a variety of reasons, for reasons that uh, Brianna's already been talking about, and that the culture uh, of some sectors of it can be quite uh, vocal in their hostility. But I would never tell a trans woman who was committed to doing something in this space, I would never tell her not to. I would never say, don't even bother, you know, go try elsewhere. Because the thing is, is that the gaming space in some ways has unique toxicity to it, but the reality, especially for trans people, is where are we going to go? If I tell someone, don't join the gaming industry, it's really awful, what am I going to tell them? Oh, oh, try joining the mainstream media. Go write a television show. Go write a play for Broadway. Are those areas any less toxic? And even more so, they're even more staid, more white, more heterosexual in so many aggressive ways. So I feel like if I'm telling them to not pursue their passion in gaming, I'm merely condemning them to a different circle of hell, yeah. ultimately. Yeah. You know, the, so the reality is bad for us all around. And so why not do what you feel your heart is in right now? If you have the ideas, if you have the spirit, if you have the drive to want to do something in this industry, then I will encourage you to weather the storm. Confronting the, the aggression in our industry, I think it requires building and sustaining community. Because what has allowed me to keep to keep myself on the straight and narrow, as it were, is being surrounded by other trans people that have been supporting my work, whose work I can in turn support and engage with critically. And that, that community is not necessarily all, you know, puppies and sunshine. So I think any of us in queer communities know, uh, we know drama. But the, 
the simple truth is, is that I would prefer that human engagement where we can sometimes disagree with each other, sometimes get upset with each other, but still at the end of the day, be cognizant of our own humanity, where me being trans or queer is not an impediment to be me being in those critical discussions. And the maintenance of that community gives me something to come back to whenever I'm done dealing with uh, especially hostile gamers or with the AAA industry, et cetera. Yeah. So. I, I think I would build on that and say, you know, one of the, the really good things about software engineering is it, it does pay very well. I mean, you know, um, for me, I'm, you know, I'm a better product manager than I am a software engineer probably, but, you know, I get scouted regularly by, like, large companies, and it is a good way to make a living. And I think you know, sometimes just survival for anyone. Like, this is a culture that's hard for anyone to make a living, right? Mm. So, I, you know, I think uh, you're talking about the, the stress sometimes between the, the, like, pure rebel indie dev and, like, you know, people that work within corporations or these institutions. And I, I could say for me, it is, on a daily basis, it is stomach-churning mm. working in the system. So, I'm not going to name names with this, but there is a a very famous person in the game industry and they threw a they recently had a thing where they had a whole bunch of people praising them for what a great ally they were to women and they threw a party for christmas and i was looking at these uh the photos online and you know they might say that they're an ally for women and gay people and queer people in general but you look at the pictures and it's like all their circle of friends is a hundred percent white white, you know, cisgender dudes. They're just hanging out with them. It's that lack of awareness and diversity. Mm -hmm. And I've had meetings in the last four days with people. And you'll sit there and you'll be talking to a venture capitalist and it's it's really disturbing. <laughs> like they will say stuff and you're like, oh, I really wish you hadn't said that because now we can't work together. Mm -hmm. And these <laughs> and these these institutions, it's it's very, very challenging to work with it. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's a there's no one answer, like you said, but I think that we we don't I think that by like taking our ball and going home and choosing to not interact with the system at all, like it is horrible and draining to do, but we need people standing up and saying, you know what, this is all white straight dudes here. We need to be represented. Look, women are half of all gamers now. Can we maybe start a game studio that's addressing all of, you know, some other needs? Like, I think we need people looking towards the future and saying like, look, I can't help but notice that most of these games are like violent, kill everything, first person shooters. Can we maybe have some games about story or experience here? And you know, we need people doing that. Yeah, and that's the thing is that I think that, my view of politics is that the, the radical fire is absolutely necessary for constantly impelling us towards the horizon of change, to allow us to never get too comfortable and to say that no, good enough is not just good enough at the end of the day, to move us towards constantly evaluating the world that we have and impelling us to, to ask what out to be at the end of the day. And so I, I do think that there's a, a great role for that. And I, I've been that person many times saying, well, yeah, this is nice, but, you know, especially when I criticize uh, transgender representations on television, you know, whether, when it's, whether it's talking about, you know, Transparent or one of these other shows, that, like, I get why this is a landmark and it's better than what has gone before, but I am not going to sit here and pretend that this is perfect and that this is uh, the mountaintop that we have been trying to reach for decades. And there's value in that. And so when it comes to the gaming industry, what I tell people is that it matters a lot to me when I see people like myself who are involved in this space. So when I'm in there, writing for the mainstream gaming press, if I'm not the only trans woman in the room, if I'm not the only Latina in the room, if I'm not the only uh, queer person in the room, right, I feel a lot better, I feel a bit safer, I've got my people that I can work with and do something with, right? And so, I, 
abstaining from the gaming industry, also the problem is, is that it will not denude games of their cultural power. They will continue to do the things that they are doing in terms of fostering the toxic communities that they tend to foster, in terms of being part of the dust storm of social messages that promote intolerance and uh, bigotry towards women and people of color and LGBT people, that will continue unabated if we boycott the industry. Yeah. So I, I, to me, I, I feel like weathering the storm and pushing our ideas in there is the best way forward. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's well said. So that, you know, I want to, I, I kind of want to take it in a different direction here. So something um, I see continually in the, the gamer space, and here I'm talking more about um, less on the developer side and more on the gamer culture side itself. I constantly see, sometimes it's a willful lack of information, but it's definite lack of information there about trans issues, how to treat transgender people, about what the basic issues at play are. So, like, if you were to what do you think are the most important messages to get out there to you know cisgender gamers not game developers but just cisgender gamers in general that we are people yeah that'd be I, a step up i think i you know i i really everything that i i can say and will probably say in terms of getting into the nitty-gritty of specifics about how to write a transgender character really just boils down to that and this is also it's not necessarily trans-specific either because it comes down to you know white people writing people of color or straight people writing queer people of any stripe that we are oftentimes essentialized as this ontological minority where we are defined entirely by being a member of that group that you can't have a, a trans character without the, their transness being the absolute fixation point of every beat in the narrative right and I think that what I want cisgender people to take away from any portrayal of us is that to get beyond simply we're human, which is important in and of itself, and it's downright tragic that that remains radical in this day and age to say that, that we are who we say we are. That if you look at a portrayal of a trans woman, the fact that she proclaims her womanhood is seen as credible that if you look at a genderqueer person, that their identity as someone who does not exist within the gender binary, that has a different gender altogether, or multiple genders, is seen as credible, as believable, as humanizing, that you would be able to step into this character's shoes and say, I understand where they're coming from. Yeah. I get their identity, actually. So that's sort of the, the broad yardstick that I'd use. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's well said. For me, um, I think one of the biggest problems with the way transgender people are represented in games is more often than not, poison is the way mm. transgender people are represented in games. And don't get me wrong, I played a lot of hours of maining poison. It's super <laughs> Street Fighter. But, you know, it's, um, f it's very interesting that, like, poison is so hypersexualized and you know I'm a mm -hmm. sex positive feminist I don't innately have a problem with that but sense this unconscious message that the only value that transgender people can have is when you live up to those those beauty ideals right like mm -hmm. your worth as a human being is if uh, a cisgender male is going to find you uh, sexy enough to objectify you mm -hmm. the way that, you know, they do, you know, many cisgender women. So mm -hmm. I think that we have to, I, I think that we've got to start pushing back against that. And I also think there is the um, value in standing up to that kind of dehumanization and abuse. You have on occasion uh, noted that I'm a little bit of a Twitter pugilist <laughs> on occasion. And I, I am, but I think there's a value in when people are abusive to stand up and to say, hold on a second, do not talk to me like that. Mm. Hold on, what you just said was <laughs> not acceptable. And something I hear a lot is I have people coming up to me and telling me that like, because they do see me standing strong against these, this kind of abuse and for these issues, it makes them feel empowered to do so as well. And I'm not suggesting that everyone out there needs to 
be a warrior the way that my gut impulse is to be, but I think that if you are a cisgender ally, you can do a hell of a lot of good mm -hmm. by just standing up and saying, hold on a second, you need to refer to that person by the pronouns that mm -hmm. they prefer. Mm -hmm. Hold on a second. Their interpretation of femininity is legitimate and you need to respect that. We need to create a gamer culture where this kind of transphobia is called out. Yes. I, I agree with that entirely. I think that the, there is enormous value in interrupting the the normal course of events that happens in gamer culture where, you know, using various transphobic slurs for people or insulting a person because they are perceived rightly or wrongly to be trans, etc., that that has to all be stopped. Mm -hmm. The One of the major issues with gamer culture that I've talked about in my academic writing is that the sphere of what is considered a game, what is considered part of play, includes things like trash talk, shit talking, etc., and that that in and of itself is also uh, something that encompasses use of prejudicial speech, whether it's calling someone the F word or the N word or insulting them for being trans or using gendered slurs against players who are perceived to be female. All those things are seen as part of what it means to play the game. Every time you confront people who say, you know, on Xbox Live or whatever, use that type of abusive language and you confront them, they say, well, this is just part of playing the game. This is what it means to, you know, play Halo or what it means to play League of Legends or whatever. And increasingly there have been efforts to disrupt that and to say, no, actually that's not part of the game. It's something that is bleeding over into people's actual lives in ways that are very destructive to both them and to the game as a whole. Yeah. And so that does need to be said and that also needs to happen in online spaces where oftentimes the same conceit of unreality is thought to apply because you're talking about a video game, yeah. right? And people have to disrupt that and say, no, that's not acceptable behavior. Yeah, yeah it's gotta change. I mean, how much, just even getting beyond queer dynamics, how many, I know so many women that just will not play games online because it's a shitty experience. I'm sorry to use language, but there's no other word for it. If I play Final Fantasy on PlayStation 4, I still get this kind of abuse constantly. And just forget mm -hmm. playing something like Halo. It's terrible. So, like, how, how can we, as a queer community, how can we, because you talked a little bit about the drama that sometimes happen, mm -hmm. happens, how can we band together? Like, what do we need to, like, think about when we're talking about supporting each other? Like, what are the principles that you have with that? Because for me, like, I, I have a rule professionally. If you follow me on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere or listen to my speeches, I do not publicly attack women, even women I, I disagree with. I just leave that alone because I don't want to participate in that abuse. I do the same thing with, um, except I, I do a little bit with Milo because he's an exception, but um, <laughs> you know, generally speaking, like I just do not attack other you know queer people. Like, what what are the principles that you have with that? So. There are a couple of things that I want to bring up, and I might go on for a little bit because they're somewhat different. Sure. But the first thing that I'd bring up in terms of principles of engagement is to try to always assume good faith uh, and to think more critically about calling in rather than calling out, mm -hmm. to treat someone like a member of a community rather than an external contagion. If you feel like someone has said something potentially prejudicial, try to engage with them in a humane way rather than simply shouting them down saying, you know, you heinous shit lord, how dare you. <laughs> like, the, the reality of it is is that, you know, I, I remember one of my very first experiences when I was blogging, uh, when I first started blogging back in August 2009, I had somewhat messed up on something by uh, going to the mat being an apologist for a cisgender friend that had said something offensive inadvertently about transgender men. And I was roasted to, uh, to a crisp, basically, to the point where one of them was saying, you know, I, I had ill-advisedly said, you know, 
I, you know, my friend, she has a terminal illness, you know, and I love her very much. And the person that was arguing with me said, you know, well, I hope that she dies sooner and rids the world of her, you know, rubbishness, basically. You know, and nothing, nothing of substance was accomplished that day. Nothing at all virtuous was done. It might have made someone feel good, but the thing is, is that as a community, when you're thinking about issues that go beyond yourself, when you're thinking about and specifically stating this is about transgender rights, so this is about the larger queer community or social justice, you are talking about collective processes that are bigger than you, and you have to ask yourself and think critically, am I doing this because it makes me feel better, It is because it is cathartic for me, or am I doing this because I think this is actually going to help something beyond myself? The other thing that I want to bring up, which I think in many ways is even more important, is to start critically interrogating what we mean by the community. Because uh, you know, the trans community shares, I think, with many other political affinity groups, a whiteness problem, a class problem, and a problem where the issues that afflict the most marginalized amongst us are not prioritized to the same extent. And so I know a lot of women in this community who are uh, sex workers, who are trans women of color, that feel like they are unable to speak up about those intersections of their identities because they live in a community where anything from respectability politics to uh, you know, kink shaming or homophobia or whatever, or ra just racism in general might shoot them down or shoot down their, their particular opinions or criticism. When I call for communities to be less toxic, what I am not doing is using the word toxic as a buzzword to say, yeah, all those angry brown people, you can feel free to ignore them. Because oftentimes, what we have seen again and again in a lot of the more mainstream pieces uh, in the mainstream press written by white, usually white cisgender men and one woman, Michelle Goldberg, um, about you know, sort of hand-wringing and concern trolling about toxicity and radical communities is that they will often end up scapegoating the people bringing the most challenging perspectives and talking from the uh, greatest distance outside of what is normally centralized in these communities. So, and, it say, and they'll be told, you're too angry, you're too unproductive, you're setting too many things on fire. And people don't want to acknowledge how that feeds into a subtle kind of racism and classism in our communities yeah. that where we feel, where we, no, please snap away, uh, where people feel that you know, they can get away with silencing those marginalized voices because someone has told them that they're not politically expedient. So I am a huge advocate for more productive communities, for detoxifying our discourse, but never ever use that to ignore genuinely marginalized voices and always check yourself to make sure that that's not happening. Because for me, when you look at the, the greatest problems faced by the trans community, even as a trans woman of color, I am Latina, I know that my risk of being murdered for who I am is lower than that of many of my other sisters, partially because I'm not, I'm not living in poverty, thankfully. I am not doing street sex work. And also, frankly, because I'm not black, I am less likely to be profiled for any of those things by the police because I am who I am. And that's a level of very gradiated privilege that I have to acknowledge, uh, even as a trans woman of color, and to ensure that my advocacy within our community and in talking about our community in spaces like these does re reflect that fact. So if you want to talk about more productive communities, there are things that need to be done on both sides of that. Obviously, we need to assume good faith call in, not call out. We need to think very critically about using social justice language and call out as catharsis, because there are many people struggling with a variety of personal issues who externalize that into activism in very destructive ways. But we also need to realize that this is a political community that remains afflicted by racism and classism and by whorephobia. And if we, and why does that matter for the gaming space? Because we're talking about stories. We're talking about who's in, who's out, who's represented, who isn't, who has access and who doesn't. And a lot of that divides along these race, class, and sexual lines. I want to see a story where a trans woman sex worker is the protagonist 
and that intersection matters a great deal specifically. I want to see political activism that doesn't use uh, sex work as a byword for shame. And, you know, because like whenever I hear people say, for instance, in comparing uh, scantily clad women in games, think, oh, they're dressed like a prostitute. What exactly are you saying with that? And who are you excluding when you talk like that in gaming spaces and politicize gaming spaces? Anyway, so that's where I wanted to go with that. I thought that was well said, very well said. No, um, I think like you're talking about some really destructive impulses, right? Like it, it leads to the politics of disposability. And this is something I find really professionally um, exhausting that you are, it seems sometimes in the, um, you know, in the queer community and also in the game industry as a whole, like you're one mistake away from being thrown away as garbage. And I see people do this to people and it's just unconscionable. You know, like something I have committed to do this year is to call in rather than call out. And I'm, I'm not gonna lie, when Gamergate first hit last year, and I found myself with this huge platform, I did get this thrill out of finding something terrible that someone would say. And then I would shame them and send like an army of pissed off people at them. And I've mm -hmm. come to realize that that is, it's, yeah, there's a quote that you have that like justice hotly delivered is not justice. It's more eloquent than that, but um, yes. 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 Yeah, I, I know the one that yeah, you're talking and, about. And yeah, I but I think that. about it. I think about it a lot. You know, like that, that kind of impulse for, you know, getting what's fair. It's just not, it's not a very helpful thing in general. I, I do want to speak about respectability politics. And I think this is the problem. I, I see this so much on the inside of the game industry because I am plugged into a lot of the larger powers that be. And there is this, I almost don't know how to describe it. It's like there's a pride by certain people that have gotten this much power at being in the center of that power and they hold on to it and they choose to be silent about all the garbage that happens. Mm -hmm. And they look down and they have scorn for people that speak out about injustice. And that is, I don't know how you feel, that is a really hard thing for me to respect. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, um, it's so destructive. And it gets into this, this false dichotomy that if you speak your mind, if you speak out about injustice, if you get angry, if you show that human side, Wrong. that somehow you are, are less than. And I, I just, you yeah, know, we've absolutely got to change it. Um, so I do want to leave like probably, uh, how would you feel about 10 minutes for questions? Sure, that sounds good to all me. All right, let's, uh, let's do it there. Do we have any, um, well, thank you all for coming first, but uh, does anybody want to stand up and give questions? Yeah, thank you. All right, boom, there we go. Okay, great. Yay. Um, so you're talking about trans women narrative. Sure. <laughs> At a loss. Uh, well, certainly, I think the work of Anna Anthropy with dysphoria is a landmark example. Uh, Matty Bryce, game developer and game critic, uh, also fellow trans woman of color with whom I have commiserated so very much. Uh, her game, My Nietzsche, was a game deliberately about her own experience as a, as a black trans woman in this society. Uh, and certainly, Merrick Copas has uh, done quite a few twine games that intersect with trans reality. I know that uh, there are also games where the, the protagonist gender is left deliberately ambiguous in a variety of ways as a way of sort of including a variety of different trans identities. So there are unfortunately no names spring to mind at the moment. There was a... Um, there were games out there like um, Negotiation, which I wrote about for Merrick Copas's Video Games for Humans anthology, which allows a wide range of gender selections, for example. Yeah. Uh, so they're definitely out there. And I think that there is uh, one example actually from the AAA sphere that I can bring up. I don't know if I'm going to embarrass the person who wrote it if I mention it, but uh, in Guild Wars 2, there is a, an openly trans character who is a trans woman, and she was created by, by a sister. So, you know, and that's, that's a, 
a little thing that I love pointing out every time I talk about what is possible when we're in there and able to write these stories. And I don't want to embarrass her too much by... <laughs> But my, uh, one of my two girlfriends, Teddy Nguyen, the pink-haired beauty sitting at the end there, she works at ArenaNet. So yes, that, it is possible and it can happen. I can say for a game we're about to put out at our studio, um, we're trying to, we deliberately wrote the character of Holiday in Revolution 60 to be, um, to give us space to make her transgender later. And there are a lot of cues to that in the script. It was actually uh, patterned after Robert Heinlein's Friday in that sense. But I can tell you for the sequel, like um, you know, we are definitely going to commit to either having a transgender protagonist or you know, I have this vision of a character in a game where being trans doesn't define her, right? So she has many things. She's a secret agent. She is someone that's hurting. You know, she is someone that has survived, and she has many things, and she also happens to be transgender. Because I, I look at games that are, you know, cost millions of dollars to make, and I don't see that kind of representation there. And I, I, I take that responsibility as a studio very seriously, because if we don't lead on that issue, if we don't think about that young transgender girl or boy that's out there looking for a character that looks like them, I don't know how we can ask AAA to. So I hope that right. answers your question. Do we have another one? Uh, yes, a person all the way in the back yep. in the kitty shirt. Can, can I answer your question just completely honestly? I think you can look at um, you know, organizations like um, you know, um, HRE, and I think that very traditionally, um, you know, the LGBT, LGB community has left the T silent all too often, and mm -hmm. I think we see transphobia very frequently in queer spaces. Yes. And yes. I think we could do a lot better on that, so I think like, um, something I've really been wondering about a lot lately is, um, you know, probably in 2000, the last time I looked at these statistics, it was that transgender people were anywhere between 100,000 to 200, one in 100,000 to one in 20,000 of the population. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know that can't be true just looking at my Twitter, right? <laughs> Like, it's got to be higher, and I think that... It almost certainly is. Yeah, it's got to be. So I think that, I think all of us, and I'm talking like cisgender feminists, you know, gay men, lesbian women, bisexual, allies, everyone has got to spend more time handing the mic to the trans community, because mm -hmm. erasure is happening constantly, and it's it's... It's the same discrimination that gay people were facing when I was growing up in the 90s. And I think that, you know, the point that you made about something GLAD style in terms of a collection of resources to support trans creators specifically, I do think that that's something that's needed, honestly. There are great organizations you can support if you want to support the cutting edge of trans activism, like the one that I used to sit on the board of, um, the, Sil the Silvia Rivera Law Project in New York City or the Third Wave Fund as well, does a lot of great work amplifying voices from the streets. Uh, but in terms of actual creators, yeah, there's still a lot of work that can be done in terms of supporting their work. And I, you'll get no disagreement from me. I wish there was a, a resource for that at the moment. Absolutely. You right there, yes. Oh. I 
think people respond well to genuineness. And I mm -hmm. think if you're a creator of any sort, like an academic or a, a creator, a writer of a script, a screenplay, a book, I think you have to be so vulnerable mm -hmm. with your audience about what your real passion is because you can't hide it. Mm -hmm. You can't. If you listen to like my work or read my work, like I am pissed off and frustrated and it comes through. And that takes a certain amount of vulnerability with my audience. And I think like, Again, I'm about to use some language here. We are drowning in bullshit, people. We are drowning in it everywhere. It's in the commercials on TV and our ads. And I think when people see something that is true and honest and is that one inch of ourselves that is mm -hmm. the truth of us, I think they respond to that. So I would say push past your fear. Make that game and I'll sure as hell buy it. So. And I'll, I'll certainly share it on my social media. Best of luck. Follow your passion, dear. Get money. That's a, a problem. <laughs> this is a big problem that I see indie developers making is they think that game dev is just something you could do by yourself, and it is really expensive. So find some money to do it. It helps a lot, trust me. Uh, who is? All right, yes. Well, I think we have to vouch for these cultures, right? Like we know, I can tell you right now, don't go apply, apply to work at Rockstar. I'm sorry if you work <laughs> at Rockstar, if you're here, their culture is not that great. And you know, your reputation gets out there. So I think you find people that you trust, that you believe in those spaces and you do it. I have to say like something I, I am amazed by Catherine is it amazes me that there's so few transgender characters in games when I know so many transgender women, they're engineers that make <laughs> games. Like, yeah. seriously, can you think of a AAA studio where you don't know a trans woman that works there? Yeah, I, and that's actually quite fascinating. I know a lot of us. Yeah. We, we're all among you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, um, I think, like, we all need to advocate and tell friends about when the culture is healthy. But it is, like, game dev is a very unhealthy culture, if you don't mind me saying. Like, mm -hmm. what do you think? Well, what I think that part of it is that, you know, in, in your case, going to your uh, PR department and saying, do you think this is something that we should get out there, right? Because one of the things that I like about what GamerX has done this year is that, you know, you look at all your program books, there are a bunch of uh, companies advertising for work and, you know, very explicitly stating their, their commitments to uh, LGBT rights, inclusion, diversity, and equality, right? And it's not to say that any of those places may be perfect places to work, but the fact that they are putting their money where their mouths are and supporting conferences like this and putting advertising to actually reach the people who are here and say, yes, we would like to put these job adverts in front of you all and have tables where you can apply for work or, or ask questions about our companies. That's the step that I think needs to be taken in terms of actually informing a larger group of people, that the, the companies themselves have to be willing to actually stand up and say, we are proud of the fact that we have this diverse group of people, not just in response to people challenging their diversity numbers, because that's usually the only place I see it, is that, well, such and such company is actually a very diverse little lady. Did you know that? Like, no, I did not know that. Why don't you actually step up and try to do something with that then, rather than just shouting down critics, right? So, be, you know, this is the thing, my advice about, you know, being constructive and being productive, that applies to companies as well. That they have to get shift out of a mode where they are defensive and into one where they actually want to be part of, you know, changing the culture. Can I add one quick thing onto that before we, and we only have like four minutes, so we'll have time for one question after this, but I want to say, Catherine, you have to get these same calls where someone from Microsoft or Apple or Google or someone else will talk to you about diversity, and it's inevitably someone that, has heard these, they realize their company has a problem mm -hmm. and they want to solve it, but it's a checkbox. 
and they are not genuinely interested in learning or changing the culture. It's just like, you know, right. and I think we see lip service a lot for the diversity issue. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do. And I think that part of the problem, too, is just that, like, I've talked to a lot of people that I believe are genuinely invested in this and want to do something. Yeah. But they run up against management yeah. that tells them that it cannot be done. You know, and that there's that that they have to pare back their expectations or their ambitions, etc. Mm -hmm. So, um, I will say that one of the companies that I have not had this problem with has been Intel, and I think that they have been doing a fantastic job over the last year of yep. uh, actually trying to do at an increasingly high level something to make the culture better and taking responsibility for you know. The, their interactions in this world. So, yeah. I, I probably shouldn't share this story, but I'm going to anyway. I went to a uh, I went to a women in tech luncheon the other day, and I get there, and I get my swag bag, and I look at the water bottle, and I'm like, what the fuck, Tinder, <laughs> Tinder, <laughs> Tinder, and I talk to the people that put it together. I'm like. What, what's going on here? Like, you realize they just had that huge lawsuit with Whitney Wolf where they sexually, like, harassed a woman out of here. And they're like, yeah, well, they wanted to give us a check. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's like so much of the time at these big companies, it's like they think that putting on a luncheon is what makes diversity so all the women mm -hmm. or could get together and like feel better about the issue when it's so much deeper the cultural problem and what i continually see is people that recognize they have a problem with their culture but don't want to check their privilege or change anything right. and i think that's a big problem we have time for one more super quick question so boom Yay. Can I join your guild? Absolutely. What, what shard are you on? You have about 150 people almost I don't create queer community that I run a company and I fire jerks. So, <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know what I can say. Do you have any suggestions, Kathleen? Yeah, I have, oh goodness, it has been so long since I've done something like this. Um, I used to be part of a, a guild in, in World of Warcraft, but it was, it was nothing like that. It was just sort of a, a generic raiding guild. Um, I think that the question is probably too big for me to answer cleanly, but what I, one thing that I think I could take on before this, a group of this size that is important is uh, maintaining the integrity of what you have in terms of creating a safe space for people who are obviously not going to be safe or comfortable being themselves in this game otherwise. And I think that that, that focusing on the first principles of your, of your guild uh, your company is what is going to see you through everything that is to follow. That the first and the first responsibility you have is to make sure that all of the queer folks in your guild feel safe, that they have a place where they can play this game collaboratively in a group, and do so without fear of being uh, mocked, attacked, harassed, stalked, whatever, for being who they are. And to follow good community management principles in terms of ensuring that, uh, yeah, this is probably the best big issue I can tackle here, is making sure that although you allow healing in the space, you do not allow the projection of catharsis to become the sole purpose of 
the guild. That, in other words, this is not a place that exists solely for people to very openly and vocally deal with their pain, but also exists for people of these identity groups to get together and have fun in a productive way that allows them to forget that pain. I think that one of the issues that sometimes comes up with uh, queer affinity groups in these spaces is that because of brute necessity, they end up becoming therapy spaces. And, you know, that's not something that I think is ultimately conducive to a long-lasting community. If that doesn't work, try blowing up helicopters for an hour in St. Tro. That makes me feel better. So thank you, everybody. Thank you.